Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The WHO Launch of ICD-11. Thank you for joining us, and before we get started, I want to take a moment to go over a few administrative details. As you have noticed upon joining the webinar, everyone has been placed on mute for the presentation. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. So in your GoToMeeting control panel, you will see a questions box. Please type your questions or comments into the field and hit enter. Also, this webinar is being recorded, so the uh, link to the recorded webinar along with the slide deck will be posted following the live webinar, and you will all receive um, at least one email with the link to the recording as well as the slide deck, um, and you'll probably receive another email from GoToWebinar with the link to that recording as well, and feel free to share that link um, with your colleagues and other folks that you think would benefit from this webinar. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to today's speaker, Ms. Donna Pickett from the CDC. Donna, it's all yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am so pleased to be able to join you this morning uh, to give you some background on the status of ICD-11 and the WHO launch. On the slide you see before you, is it's a history of um, the ICD dating back to the first ICD that was adopted in 1900 um, and fast forwarding through to ICD-10, uh, adopted in 1989 by the World Health Assembly, um, currently in use in many, many countries uh, for mortality. The U.S. began using ICD-10 for mortality in 1999. And of course, recent memory, um, the clinical modification used in morbidity applications uh, was launched in October 2015. So again, uh, the WHO version of ICD-10 um, has been around for oh, almost 25 years. Uh, in the time that ICD-10 was published, it was manually curated. Uh, so the tabular list came out first in 1992, and then the index was published approximately two years later, um, which even though the WHO um, in their resolution to adopt ICD-10 gave an effective date of 1993, countries really could not begin uh, the uh, migration process until both the tabular and the alphabetic index were available. Next slide, please. So fast forward to the you know, 25, 26 years of ICD-10. It's been translated into 43 languages used in over 100 countries, um, with more than uh, a dozen countries actually having their own national modifications. Here in the US, we call it ICD-10-CM, but Germany, France, Canada, Australia, a number of countries also have their own national versions. Uh, the ICD, um, for those of you not so familiar with the mortality side, is the basis for global cost-specific mortality statistics. Next slide, please. So having been completed in the early years of 1990, no surprise that WHO um, identified the fact that there are uh, lots of sections of ICD-10 that are outdated, both clinically and from a classification perspective. Um, there were a number of proposals, even though WHO had an updating process for ICD-10. There were a lot of things happening in the clinical world that could not be accommodated in ICD-10 um, to be consistent with that structure. And so, in 2007, a decision was made 
to begin work on ICD-11. Next slide, please. So on this slide, basically, we're showing you uh, from the WHO perspective, um, you know, what was the impetus behind uh, beginning the revision process? And for those of you who have followed um, the ICD-9 process, which now has the ICD-10-CM, ICD-10-PCS process, um, the issues are the same. There have been advances that couldn't be accommodated within the current structure and conventions. Um, nodding to the use of digital uh, technology as opposed to things being manually curated. Um, there were just so many things that needed to be addressed and that had been identified during the ICD-10 update process um, that it was determined that another revision of ICD would be necessary. And again, you'll notice that some of these are ve very familiar to what was uh, the experience in the US for ICD-9-CM, where we ran out of space um, in many areas of the classification, particularly those areas um, that had seen major clinical advances. Next slide. So what were some of the goals that ICD-11 uh, is attempting to address, again, from the international perspective? Well, one, it was deemed important that ICD-11 would be able to function in an electronic environment, a digital product that is linked to other terminologies and classifications and could be uh, a support tool in electronic health records and information systems. But it would also be multi-purpose. Uh, by way of history for the ICD, it had its basis and foundation in mortality statistics until about uh, the sixth or seventh revision. Um, of course, having now used nine and 10 um, for a number of purposes that go beyond statistics and utilization, um, there was a keen sense that those other purposes had to be addressed and incorporated where feasible into the next revision of the ICD. So no longer just focusing on mortality, uh, there was a view that primary care, clinical care, research, public health, um, should also be a major focus of the update. And of course, morbidity. Um, ICD-10, while it did have uh, more detail added to it related to morbidity, it was clear that it needed to go further when looking at the possibilities for ICD-11. And that there should be consisti con <clears throat> sorry, consistency and interoperability across across different use cases and multilingual um, primarily because WHO um, has responsibility in a number of languages other than just English. And so you see those listed um, on the last line of this particular slide. Next slide, please. So this slide is a representation of how integration and coordination and harmonization um, are intended to work with ICD-11. And so you see arrows pointing to other WHO classifications, um, ICF, the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, um, the International classification of health interventions, uh, which will be the WHO procedure coding system that uh, when completed, it is now in beta, um, will also be added to the family. And looking at the related classifications for primary care, external causes of injury, um, the ISO 999 uh, standard, um, but also looking at derived classifications of ICD-10. Um, to draw information and knowledge 
um, from those classifications and draw all of that up into ICD-11. And of course, looking at terminologies and vocabularies, um, specifically SNOMED CT on the terminology side. Next slide. So this very busy slide just gives you um, a view of all of the resources and medical clinical input that went into developing ICD-11. Uh, there was an overarching structure, um, and but a lot of work at the detail level. So you'll see uh, tags mentioned for internal medicine, pediatrics, dentistry, neoplasms. Tags are topic advisory groups, and those are the groups that basically worked um, on specific chapters or collaborated with other uh, tags or working groups in formulating the content for ICD-11. And then overarching those groups are the morbidity tag, the mortality tag, functioning, quality, safety, and uh, primary care. Again, all of those taking the broad view of how the individual chapters and the knowledge within those chapters would fit into um, the bigger picture in crafting ICD-11. Next slide. So the overlay here just gives you specific information about how many topic advisory groups and working groups there are. And again, these are all uh, at the international level. So it wasn't Eurocentric, it wasn't US-centric. Um, you had a number of countries that were participating in this process. And this was the largest revision enterprise ever undertaken by the WHO. Um, there were hundreds of scientists and clinicians that have contributed to it. More than a thousand proposals were uh, received and reviewed. Um, and more than 90 countries have been involved um, in some shape, form, or fashion in the production, the reviews, testing and or commenting um, on at various points during the curation of ICD-11. Next slide, please. So overall, again, the process started in 2007. And in 2015, WHO uh, commissioned um, an external review. Uh, I kind of liken it to a pulse check. You know, where are we? How far are we? Are there any gaps? Uh, what remains to be done? Phase one, which ran from 2007 until 2015, uh, is where we had the extensive clinical inputs from the um, topic advisory groups and, and working groups and others. Uh, phase two uh, went from April 2015 to uh, roughly June of 2018. And again, a focus was mortality and morbidity statistics to make sure that the classification uh, was fit for purpose for both purposes. Phase three, um, until right up until this very moment, uh, really was looking at preparations uh, related to the implementation version. That implementation version was posted on the WHO website in June of 2018. Um, and uh, I'll provide a little more information about some of those preparations. And then phase four, which will be again after the World Health Assembly adoption of ICD-11, which is scheduled to take place um, in May, uh, will be the maintenance period. Uh, for the time being, similar to what occurred in the US, there is a freeze on ICD-11 content. And ICD-10, again, WHO version, is no longer being updated. Next slide. Uh, I frequently receive questions about um, you know, was the U.S. involved in the development process? And this slide just provides you um, just a bit of information on um, 
the work that the U.S. engaged in during the uh, 2007 to 2015, 2016 uh, further curation of ICD-11. So yes, the U.S. was involved. However, again, this was um, 90 countries being involved, um, but the U.S. did have the pleasure of serving as co-chair of several of the overarching topic advisory groups, um, but also participated in um, the Joint Task Force, which uh, replaced a few other groups after the tags were sunsetted. Um, again, focusing on morbidity and mortality, but a lot more uh, involvement on the morbidity side, as that is where most of the growth has occurred in the ICD-11 at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the major differences between ICD-10 and ICD-11? Um, well, the codes are going to look different. ICD-10, um, your base code was a three-character code, primarily used by mortality. Um, but in ICD-11, it'll be a four-character code. Um, but I'll show you some other examples of changes um, as we get further into the presentation. Um, in terms of structure, they've tried to simplify the structure. Instead of having uh, codes that are pre-coordinated, um, an example of a pre-coordinated code would be acute cough or chronic cough or diabetes with uh, neurological uh, manifestations. What has occurred in ICD-11, some of that is now being handled not as a pre-coordinated code, but as post-coordination, where you would assign multiple codes to fully describe the clinical picture. Introduced in ICD-11 is also a feature called clustering, where you are combining two or more codes, again, in a very coordinated way to fully describe the picture but it also shows linkages so that you can understand that the stem code is related to a subsequent code and how those relate. And again, there's an example here in this slide, but I'll show you other examples later in the presentation. Next slide. So what else is different? Um, the chapter numbering is different. They now are going to be using Arabic numbers and not Roman numerals in um, ICD-11. It's now a minimum of four character reporting as opposed to three character. And again, I'm talking about ICD-10 WHO version, not ICD-10-CM for those of you who are familiar with the alphanumeric seven character codes. And there'll be two uh, levels of subcategories. Uh, for the coding scheme, um, the uh, second letter of the code will always uh, be a letter to distinguish it from an ICD-10 code. Um, and there will be no L's and I's and zeros and O's um, because they do get confusing. And so uh, like other vocabularies and classifications, um, to avoid that confusion, it has been changed. Some of you will be familiar with that concept, though, because ICD-10 PCS on the procedure side took a similar approach when ICD-10 PCS was being developed. And the first character of the ICD-11 code will always relate to the chapter. Next slide. So some other major differences. Um, there are revisions, restructuring of some chapters and, and uh, sections, such as the infectious disease chapter, uh, HIV, uh, valvular diseases. Some diseases have, have changed location and moved from one chapter to another. An example, the cerebrovascular diseases has moved from circulatory to the nervous system. There are six new chapters in ICD-11. And you see a list of them there for you. 
Um, extension codes is a new feature completely um, related to ICD-11. Um, and I'll show you examples of that. Um, but those are, uh, the extension codes are optional. Um, but there are some possible implications um, for the U.S. if we are thinking about moving to ICD-11. And for the first time, there is a chapter on traditional medicine um, in ICD-11. And again, by traditional medicine, we mean the actual diagnosing used in traditional medicine, not the services performed. Um, in traditional medicine practice. Next slide. So we have ICD-11 MMS, meaning morbidity and mortality. Even though it says mortality and morbidity, I'm, I've straddled both, so I always think morbidity first because of the work at, here at NCHS CDC. Um, there is a foundation component. I am not going to provide a lot of detail on that, but there is an abundant amount of information on the WHO website um, if your curiosity is piqued by kind of what's under the hood. Um, and again, ICD-11 sought to incorporate advances in science and medicine, uh, but there is structural consistency with ICD-10 where possible. Next slide. So tabular lists um, fit for a particular purpose. Um, so there are aspects that may be germane to mortality, um, and there are some that may be very specific to morbidity, but those are actually built into the classification. Um, with a goal of having an ICD-11 that encompasses all uh, purposes and business use cases, uh, as opposed to countries and or subspecialty groups trying to develop uh, their own versions, um, because parts of the ICD previously were lacking in certain areas. Um, again, new content, there are now 27 chapters as I outlined on the previous slide. And then we now have new methods, um, some pre-coordination uh, with STEM codes, but uh, truly focusing on post-coordination to use multiple codes as opposed to developing hundreds and hundreds of pre-coordinated codes, which obviously expands uh, the code set drastically. Um, sanctioning rules, multiple parenting rules, um, a lot of new features that have been um, raised over the lifespan of ICD-10 um, have been addressed as part of ICD-11. And there are new and improved tools. And again, these are tools that are specific to WHO. Um, yes, there are coding tools and browsing tools, um, but they relate to the WHO version. Um, and comparisons, for instance, with the mapping tool um, and or coding tool would be comparing WHO ICD-10 to WHO ICD-11. Next slide. So extension codes, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is a, a new chapter. Um, WHO has designed it to be um, optional, um, but again, that will require, I think, additional discussion here in the US because some of the things that are in these uh, extension codes, and there are about 7,500 extension codes, um, some of them are things we are already capturing um, in different value sets here in use in the US. Um, a good example of that in the second column under type two, you have uh, diagnosis timing, which is the second item on the list. Well, within diagnosis timing, um, you have present on admission, something that the US has been gathering information on um, for a num number of years, um, but not part of the classification itself. 
neither 9CM or 10CM, it's a separate data element. Well, ICD-11 actually has codes um, for present on admission, which includes present on admission, developed after admission, and uncertain timing of onset. And so that may be a decision point um, in terms of uh, what should be factored into uh, use in the US, or do you remain with um, your current data capture? And again, these are all questions that will um, come about and likely evolve as we learn more information about ICD-11. So again, you see there's a rich uh, base in terms of the extension codes, uh, the type ones, um, there's severity scale value, um, there's a mild, moderate, severe scale, there's a tumor spread scale, clinical staging, a lot of depth and detail in information. Temporality, um, you know, how long has the person had the condition? At what point in their life what, did they develop the condition? Um, duration of pregnancy, um, etiology, all of these bold um, types all have exquisite amount of detail under them. Um, but I just wanted to give you some, some background in terms of what is now included in ICD-11. Next slide. And so this is a link to the WHO website. There is um, uh, ICD-11 webpage uh, that is now standing uh, with uh, various parts of the classification explained. There are videos, um, there's a coding tool, uh, there's a browser, um, just the frozen version of what was posted in June of 2018. Uh, ICD-11 is being made available in various output formats and um, we show those as listed. And then yes, there will be a real paper version. Uh, a question that uh, WHO gets a lot and so do we. Um, while everybody uh, you know, would prefer to work in an electronic environment, there are still those that really would also like to have a printed version. Next slide. So the way forward for ICD-11, again, um, after World Health Assembly adoption, uh, the maintenance and updating process will begin. However, there will be a freeze of approximately three to four years um, before the next full update of ICD-11. Um, they do have a new governance model uh, for ICD-11 that replaced the model that was used for updating ICD-10. Um, there is a medical and scientific advisory committee. There is a classifications and statistics advisory committee. Um, and all of the work that WHO does is supported by member states, including the US. Next slide. Uh, WHO has developed a full suite of implementation uh, resources to facilitate ICD-11 uptake. There are advocacy materials, training materials, um, maps to and from 10. Again, cautionary, this is for the WHO classifications. Uh, they will not be doing any of these types of materials for countries that have developed their own national clinical modifications. So this is all base 10, base 11. Next slide. So the process and agreeing of adopting ICD-11, um, at this point, WHO has accomplished step one and two. Um, again, working with international groups, more than 300 um, specialists and other institutions um, all over the world. Um, member states have had technical com consultations with WHO provided input um, on a regular basis. So again, the idea is that this would be a much more transparent process for WHO um, than past curation of previous revisions of ICD would be. Next slide.
And again, we've already uh, accomplished step three um, because the uh, quote unquote frozen version of uh, ICD-11 was posted in June of 2018 and was being made available to provide member states and others an opportunity to actually see this, review it, um, and provide additional comment if necessary um, before the World Health Assembly vote um, this coming May. Um, Step four has also been accomplished. The executive board of the World Health Assembly met in January uh, where there were specific discussions about um, comments that were made at various points during the development of ICD-11. The Joint Task Force on ICD-11 did publish a end of mission report, which is also available on the, I the WHO ICD-11 web pages. And the next and final step is step five, um, where the uh, executive board resolution to uh, approve and adopt ICD-11 will go before the World Health Assembly in May to become effective uh, January 1, 2022. And again, I will provide more information on that because I don't want anyone to panic that it's right around the corner. What are we going to do? So hold off because I know you have questions and I've tried to address them in the slides. Next slide. Case in point, um, when WHO says 2022 for ICD-11, the history is that even though an effective date is always provided with each revision, and on the screen you have um, information about the adoption of ICD-10. Again, it was adopted by the World Health Assembly in 1990 with an effective date of January 1, 1993. But when you look at bullet number two, and this is focusing on morbidity, so um, not just looking at the mortality side, you'll see that even though an effective date was January 1993, as you can see, almost no country can implement effective on that date. Basically, what that effective date means in WHO speak, it is that it is the earliest that WHO will be able to accept coded data in the new version. And so, um, you know, so this isn't just from a, a US perspective. Um, this is the actual experience um, for several countries. Now, the countries that are listed here are the ones that have their own clinical modification uh, for case mix and reimbursement. But on the uh, mortality side, and I will provide a little um, insight on the mortality side, uptake is not immediate nor expected. Um, and as that's the third bullet point, WHO has noted that the switch to ICD-11 is unlikely to happen overnight. And while there may be a few early adopters, not many countries are likely to adapt that quickly. Next slide. So from a US-centric perspective, when will the US implement ICD-11 for mortality? And for those of you who may not be aware, um, there were two pathways for ICD-10 in the US, a mortality pathway and a morbidity pathway. Um, for mortality, um, you know, there are a number of steps that also have to occur, some very similar to what occurs on the morbidity side. So, you know, there has to be a revision of the automated coding systems and decision tables, a retraining of nosologists and medical coders. And these are not your nosologists and medical coders that are in your hospitals and physicians' offices. These are generally um, nosologists and medical coders at your state health departments who process death certificates and send that information to NCHS, um, which is how we derive underlying cause of death statistics and all of the mortality statistics you see publicized. Um, and of course, revision of computer edits, database specifications, changes to tabulation lists, table programming, 
um, comparability studies, which in other countries is called bridge coding, and development of educational and promotional materials. Next slide. So by way of history, ICD-10 for the US, it took seven years to implement from the publication of the tabular list before we were able to implement in 1999 for mortality. And again, the assumptions are there'll be sufficient resources in terms of personnel and IT changes and system changes and that uh, the international collaborative work that needs to occur on uh, making revisions to decision tables and automated software will occur. So again, not an overnight, but WHO is, is aware of this. Um, but again, some countries, it may not take that long, particularly if they have um, a more simplified uh, way of gathering mortality data. And then of course, you have low resource country that are not so closely tied to um, informatics and, and you know, uh, technological changes. Um, but again, this is just to show a history. Um, you know, just there's a date, yes, but that is not the drop dead date for mortality to implement. And I think a similar path will be seen in the US, and I think I have a slide. The next slide will show that. Yeah, so in the US, no sooner than 2025 or 2024. Um, now, morbidity, separate pathway, HIPAA rulemaking, all of which many of you are likely to be familiar with. But there are some other um, issues that have to be discussed and decisions made on the morbidity side um, before moving forward. Uh, WHO lysing implications. Um, you know, we're not clear yet on the operational mechanisms regarding copyright restrictions. Those specifications have not been spelled out yet. Um, how will, for US government purposes, be defined when uh, the agreement with WHO and the US um, was signed? Um, it was a broad statement about U.S. government purposes. But as you can see, even in 1990, the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics reported that you know, government use is not a single definition. It is, you know, the ICD is ubiquitous. It is used, you know, for on the re, you know, morbidity side, it is used for DRGs, other case mix. Um, patient safety, physician's offices, home health, rehab. Um, so lots of uses, many of them just directly tied to government use, but not all. And a question that needs to be um, answered is the impact that a co possible copyright would have on cost and use in the US. Um, would publishers of the code books, would vendors building in ICD-11 into their systems? You know, what are the possible cost and copyright restrictions, limitations? Again, ICD-9-CM and ICD-10-CM are in the public domain. Um, anybody can and does use the classification, and there are no charges or costs incurred by the users. Um, Another issue that has been raised is um, WHO has indicated that they want to see a limit on the development of national modifications. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are about two dozen national modifications. In building ICD-11, WHO did look at all of those clinical modifications um, to really try to bring in uh, the best and most necessary of changes that um, could be considered for an international classification. But the question as to what limitations member states will be uh, restricted to has not yet been spelled out. 
Um, and then, of course, there are uh, revisions likely needed for any of the HIPAA standards to accommodate the ICD-11 structure and conventions and new features. Um, and so, um, by example, when we moved from ICD-9 CM codes to ICD-10 CM codes, uh, there was a change request put forward to X12 uh, to modify reporting to accommodate the ICD-10 CM and ICD-10 PCS alphanumeric seven character structure. Um, and that was done early on in 2003, years before the code sets were actually adopted. Um, you know, how will we handle post coordination? Will we need to increase uh, the number of codes used to describe one condition where now some of those things in ICD-10 CM are pre-coordinated? And then, of course, there's uh, the clustering example that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the preferred way of reporting codes to WHO, that, not that we report codes on the morbidity side, though we do on more, the mortality side, is the syntax that runs as a string. So you would have two codes, but separated by the forward slash to show two codes in a cluster to describe the duodenal ulcer uh, that has acute intestinal bleeding. Um, you know, how are we going to accommodate it, that in our environment? Um, if we're not a, a day, uh, able to report that particular string, uh, how else might we uh, accommodate um, providing the same information that the clustering in ICD-11 provides. And we don't have a way of clustering now because it isn't a, a necessary component of ICD-10-CM. Next slide. And so a couple of additional examples under um, possible revisions to existing HIPAA standards. The second bullet point um, which is a fracture of shaft of the ulna. Um, you can see at the bottom line, there is a cluster, which results in, I think it's six codes, one, two, three, four, five, six codes as a cluster to describe the fracture of the shaft of the ulna left side the fact that it's an open fracture, which is an extension code, as is the laterality code, and that because of the fall um, from one level to the next, uh, you have another extension code, and of course you have the place of currents. Um, and an additional cause indicating that uh, the person was on an uneven surface. So again, how you take that cluster and represent that in the current X12 environment, for instance, um, you know, will need consideration. Um, and the next bullet point is you know, decisions about uh, what ICD-11 considers optional features and what may be necessary to be mandatory in the US. Um, laterality, as you know, Laterality is built into many of the ICD-10 CM codes. However, in ICD-11, it is an extension code. Um, how do we want to accommodate that? Do we want to use uh, the WHO extension codes as defined and described? Or is there something else in terms of reporting that one may want to do. And again, I mentioned present on admission earlier. And then you know, again, how to represent those, the post coordination and the clustering. Are additional fields going to be necessary to capture six codes possibly compared to the two or three codes that we may use currently in the 10 CM environment? And um, and this discussion will be taken up by the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, you know, uh, there needs to be an evaluation of ICD-11 to see if perhaps a U.S. clinical modification is needed. And 
given all the detail that you have in ICD-11, you may be wondering, well, <laughs> what else could you possibly need? Um, if we go to the next slide, please. This just gives you a quick snapshot of, of why considerations may be needed for clinical modifications. Um, and there's more that could be added, but again, this is you know, a, a real quick shot. Um, encounter for prophylactic breast removal. That code was added in ICD-9-CM in 1994. It never appeared in ICD-10. Of course, was carried over into um, ICD-10-CM. As a unique concept, it is not represented in ICD-11. Um, concept of female genital mutila mutil uh, mutilation. ICD-9-CM, we added a code in 2004. It wasn't in 10. We added it in 10-CM. It is now a concept in 11. Um, genetic susceptibility to breast cancer. Um, we added it in 9CM and 10CM. It is not in ICD-11. Um, laterality, yes, it is in 10CM, was not in 10, was not in 9CM. But again, as a pre-coordinated code, in ICD-11, you would be using an extension code. So there are going to be areas within ICD-11 that we would need to look at to see how that compares um, in, in the level of detail that is in 10CM and how it's represented. And if it's a frequently used code, uh, what decisions uh, do we need to look at in deciding whether a clinical modification for ICD-11 is necessary? And CDC is uh, crafting a, a, a more detailed list of some of these uh, concept coverage issues um, as we go along. And again, a lot of this will also be looking to the proposals that have been presented um, at uh, the ICD-10 Coordination and Maintenance Committee uh, to see, again, where gaps may occur or where we may need to do something in in submitting a proposal possibly to WHO for coverage for something in ICD-11. Next slide. So ICD-10-CM implementation timeline. This is just you know, giving you kind of the, uh, the view of what happened in the US uh, that ultimately um, got us to implementing 10-CM and PCS October 1, 2015. Um, the evaluation of 10 for US purposes uh, occurred between 1994 and 1997. Uh, the National Committee held hearings between 1997 and 2003, ultimately issuing a letter of recommendation to the secretary to move forward with adoption of the two code sets. But then you see the history after 2003 when the first um, NPRM notice of proposed rulemaking um, was published, and then the subsequent NPRMs and final rules and interim rules. And again, culminating in an October 1, uh, 2015 uh, implementation date. Next slide. And so this is the slide with lots of question marks. Um, because uh, we don't have all the answers. Certain decision points um, have not uh, been addressed yet, but the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics has been monitoring, monitoring um, ICD-11. Um, we have provided information to the committee um, over the years, as far back, I believe, as 2016, 2017, for sure. All of that information is um, still available on the National Committee's website. Recently, in February, um, the National Committee did um, send two letters of recommendation to the Secretary, one specific to evaluation of ICD-11. Um, that 
may be of interest to you. So I invite all of you um, to actually visit the NCVHS website and take a look at those things for yourself. The committee will also be doing hearings. Um, June and a round table is planned for August. Um, but when it comes to the future of um, rulemaking under HIPAA, you'll notice none of us have a crystal ball, so you have a lot of question marks. Um, and so um, lots of activity. Again, some decision making key points that um, are important. And so for those who have expressed a concern that ICD-11 is right around the corner and you know we have until 2022. Um, I think from this presentation, you might be able to see uh, you know, some insight into how that may not be uh, the case. And of course, for anything related to morbidity, rulemaking was involved and still would be involved. Uh, again, the National Committee letter to the Secretary um, does recommend shortening that time frame, um, you know, for the rulemaking process to occur. However, rulemaking is still very much a part of the process. And with that, I will uh, turn um, the microphone back over to the moderator, Samantha. Thanks so much, Donna. Now, if everybody, um, you can go ahead and type your questions into the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, the first one that we have for ICD-11 extension codes, can a base code be extended by only one extension, or can there be multiple extension codes? There, there can be multiple extension codes. One of the examples that I had in one of the slides shows multiple extension codes, but it also can be multiple stem codes, um, like the uh, GI bleeding um, with the ulcer. That's two stem codes. Those aren't extension codes. Those are both stem codes. Uh, but one of the slides did give you an example of, of how you can use multiple stems with multiple extension codes. But again, with the syntax WHO has um, developed, it is to keep them clustered so that they're all together and you know what relates to what. Thanks. Another question that came in when folks were registering, um, do you know of any HIPAA transaction stru structural changes will be needed? Now that we have a um, final stable version of ICD-11, um, we will pick up with X-12, and I believe there are some folks on the call who might be able to provide better insight. Discussions had started last year before um, WHO published in June 2018. Again, we were waiting for stability, but those discussions about what might need to happen in an X-12 environment will indeed be taken up again. Thanks. Another question that came in during the process. Uh, this attendee states, I would like to better understand the next leg of the adoption process that takes place after who has completed the review and adoption. Typically what happens after it is, the World Health Assembly adopts, each member state goes into um, working session to uh, work out an agreement. In this case, it would be the U.S. working out an agreement with WHO on use of ICD-11 and the parameters that would need to be discussed uh, before moving forward. Um, and again, some of those key decision points about copyright, um, whether or not the U.S. will be limited to um, using ICD-11 and not creating an ICD-11-CM. Uh, some of those things will need to be decided um, 
and would likely be part of the discussions that would be undertaken um, by the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics as part of its hearings. And if you recall, ICD-10 CM PCS hearings, um, all stakeholders were invited in to provide that perspective, which ultimately led to the committee um, sending the secretary in 2003 a letter of recommendation on the code sets. I would expect that, that the process will be similar. There may be some changes, but I think it will be tweaked rather than a whole scale change. Thanks, Donna. This um, for the attendees. This is Lori Burkhart uh, with the, part of the Weedy Board. Um, Donna, again, thank you for sharing your information. One of the items that we brought forth that we thought this would be a good discussion, and we're having a session at our Weedy conference in La Jolla later in May, is trying to get the industry thinking about ICD-11. When ICD-10 occurred. Um, as Donna already pointed out, we did have to move from 4010 to 5010 version because that code qualifier for ICD-10 was in 5010. Um, and then there was concerns about, you know, um, moving patient information from ICD-9 coding to ICD-10. There was a lot of that discussion, but it felt there was an opinion that it was just a code change. And what we're trying to do now is making sure the industry understands um, what ICD-11 is going to mean to the healthcare industry. Because I think, Donna, you did an outstanding job of starting to get that training process going forward. It's not just a code. That code is becoming more than telling us the health of the individual. It's, it's going beyond that, and, and as you referred, there was like the presence of admission and, and going into those different levels. So I, I think that the question that came up from the individual about the changes to standards, great question. Um, it's not just X12, there's NCPDP, there's how does this impact the health records um, within the EHR systems? So I guess, so my thought, Donna, is um, where, how do we get that conversation going, in your opinion? Um, what is, you know, so it's not just getting the rule out there, but maybe getting the education, because I, what um, Rich is going to be speaking to at our May conference is, you know, starting the conversation about what it's going to take and, and what does it mean, and let's think about is it necessary, but at some point it's going to be. So as an industry, we want to make sure we implement and we don't impact the, um, the patient's health. Your thoughts on any of that or did it, was well, I just I, I think, <laughs> well, I mean, my first thought is, you know, if we're trying to do this in a transparent way, one of the almost best ways to do this is, is to work with and through the national committee because they're taking on board input from all the stakeholders because um, i think what and this may be a personal reflection but having lived through all of the i-10 um, era of implementation stakeholders sometimes tend to get very uh, siloed in their approach and i think it's excellent that we have a venue that one can actually um, share those perspectives in a in a very public group as opposed to you know organization A kind of doing its thing organization B doing something because um, I think at, at toward the end you really need to have everybody in together learning from each other um, you know, sharing ideas and thoughts and seeing that happen probably sooner than later, as kind of occurred with the ICD-10 PCSCM um, transition, it would probably be a good thing. Because um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Laurie. It, it's not just a code and how the codes are used. And in the U.S., they are used very differently than they are in many countries. 
I mean, again, for us, it's kind of ubiquitous that the codes are used, you know, in home health and rehab and every place else. That is not the scenario in other countries. And so our stakeholder um, grouping is much larger. Um, and getting all those perspectives in, I think, is important. Thank you. Sam, it looks like we've hit um, our time slot. Did you want to wrap it up? Yep. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody uh, participating in the webinar as well as our wonderful uh, presenter. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this. And I will be emailing out the link to the recorded w webinar. Um, as well as the PDF version of the slide deck to everybody. So thank you again for joining us today, and um, enjoy the rest of your week.